Welcome back to the Florida Travel Fanatics Podcast. I'm Clark. I'm Heather. And this is episode 28, How to Enjoy Florida's Wildlife, Zoos, Aquariums, and Natural Habitats. Before we get into this episode, we wanted to let you know that we just put our first podcast episode on YouTube. We took the audio from episode 18 about St. Petersburg and added videos and website images from all the topics in that episode. Going forward, we're planning to release each audio podcast as usual every other Tuesday, but release it on YouTube a week later. We're testing to see how well it's going to be received, and we'd love your feedback on it. So if you're not familiar with what a video podcast is, normally it's basically a podcast, but with video with it, kind of (laughs) self-describing. And typically, the, their people record themselves recording their podcasts, which we don't care for. And we're not no, that perfect. We're not Dad. that <laughs> perfect. Yeah, we're, we're not. We're not. Well, yeah, we're too middle aged to you put could ourselves have your on video. Bloopers. Yeah, so we just didn't feel like having a camera sitting in the room and having you watch us record our podcast. So what we thought about was just, hey, let's add the content in. Uh, like when I go back and go and I edit, when I edit a, a episode, I go through when I do the links in the episode notes, I go through and check all those links. Well, in the middle of checking all those links, you see the best websites and images of things that we're talking about. So basically I take pictures or videos of those and put those in the video video part of the podcast as we're talking. So you get to see the websites and see the things. And some people prefer to maybe sit at their desk and listen to a podcast on, on YouTube, on videos, and they're, they're not podcast people with a podcast app. Those of you listening to audio, you are podcast people because you're listening to this. Uh, so we want to make that available, and we'll see how that how that goes. We'll likely go back and take other episodes, especially the more popular ones, and add images to those and put those up periodically. So we'll put the links to that uh, in the episode notes. We also just put a new video on our YouTube channel of the Courtney Campbell Causeway Trail, which goes across Tampa Bay. It allows you to bike, job, jog, walk, or skate across Tampa Bay. And we'll put that link in there as well. In this week's Florida Travel News, Travel and Leisure Magazine just published a list of the top 10 airports in the United States based on votes from over 165,000 readers. That's a lot of readers. Two airports in Florida were ranked in the top 10, uh, including Tampa at number three and Palm Beach International at number eight. The ratings were based on ease of access, check-in and security, restaurants and bars, shopping and design. People rate airports for shopping. That's a, that's a new one. First place was actually Manchester, New Hampshire, and second place was Indianapolis. I've flown through Manchester, and I'd agree that's, that's a great airport. We've also heard from friends of ours in the Fort Myers area that their airport, Southwest Florida International, is really easy to get in and out of, and so is Pensacola, in our opinion. Having flown through Tampa and Palm Beach, we'd agree they're very nice airports to travel through. And we hear from people regularly that come to Tampa to see us for work or for business or for, business or for pleasure, how, much, how nice the airport is and how much they like it. Palm Beach International is in South Florida in the Palm Beach area. It's a good option for those who travel into South Florida. So if you're booking flights, when you're booking flights, don't forget to look up Palm Beach International or sometimes called West Palm Beach. Wikiwachi Springs is one of the best known and most popular kayaking or stand-up paddling spots in Florida. There has always been a little friction between the residents who live along the Wikiwachi River and those who just like to go out there and paddle. The residents don't really like having so many people on the river right behind their house, and they don't love it when people are out there anchoring or beaching their kayaks and then hanging out, smoking, drinking beers, and basically having a riverside tailgate party. All of this activity puts a lot of stress on the river since a lot of litter was being left behind and people beaching along the river. It was tearing up the riverbed and destroying a lot of the eelgrass in the river. And that's a crucial part of the Wikiwachi ecosystem. Michael McGrath of the Florida Springs Council said that the river was being loved to death. Just this week, Fish, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission approved a final rule establishing a springs protection zone on the Wikiwachi River. It won't restrict the number of people who can still paddle on the river, but it will restrict beaching, mooring, anchoring, and grounding of vessels on the spring run of the Wikiwachi River. It's a 5.6-mile section that runs from Wikiwachi State Park to Rogers Park Boat Ramp. Most of the outfitters that we've used check for disposables and single-use bottles and snacks, um, and they don't let you take those down. But for those who have access to the river by other points, can't be checked. When we've paddled the river, one of the things we noticed was how clean, quiet, and trash-free it has been, as well as serene and beautiful, until you round a bend and there's a traffic jam of boats and super loud music standing under the signs that say, no beaching. And no fishing. And no no fishing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We've experienced some of this ourselves when we've been there, and we're really happy to see this rule um, enacted. Yeah, that's definitely progress for sure. The surface ocean temperature around the Florida Keys soared to 101.9 to 
0.19 Fahrenheit this week degrees or 38 degrees Celsius in what could be a global record as ocean heat around the state reaches unprecedented extremes. The United Nations World Meteorological Meteorological Organization reported earlier this month that global sea temperatures have reached monthly record highs since May, driven in part by El Nino. Sea surface temperatures worldwide have broken monthly records for heat in April, May, and June. A water temperature buoy located in the waters of Manatee Bay in the Everglades National Park recorded this high temperature a few days ago. Other nearby buoys topped 100, which is 38 Celsius, and the upper 90s, 35 to 37 Celsius. Normal water temperatures for this area this time of year should be between 73 and 88 Fahrenheit, 23 to 31 Celsius, according to to NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. This is really bad for corals, especially new corals being grown for restoration work. They get bleached by the water that's too warm, and scientists at the University of Miami are saying this may be the worst bleaching event in the history of the Florida Keys. They're taking heroic steps to rescue the corals and put them in safe places until the water cools off to normal levels. And moving corals to NOAA's land-based aquarium, which is effectively a gene bank designed to protect the the genetic diversity of Florida coral. Some of the metal trees that they use to grow coral are actually being moved into deeper water whenever that's possible. However, this doesn't mean that the oceans are too warm to swim in. NOAA has a website that shows water temperatures around the entire coast of the United States. And we, of course, looked at Florida temperatures. And it ranges anywhere from 82 degrees Fahrenheit to 91 degrees Fahrenheit, or 27 Celsius to 33 Celsius. The highest temperatures were in bays and inlets and not at the coast or the beach where it's more in the mid 80s. We were just, I was just at Honeymoon State Park near us. Um, We're in Tampa and currently it's at 85 degree water, which was actually perfect for a hot day. You you know, your your lips didn't turn blue um, and it wasn't too much of a shock, but you stayed cool when you were in the water. So we found that it wasn't really a problem um, locally. So you can just check if you want to get an idea of what your weather's going to be like at the beach, water temperature. And we'll put the link in the episode notes. While this is certainly a hot summer all over the world, it was 105 degrees in Rome, Italy recently, it's a great time to go to the beach. To avoid sunburn and keep from getting overheated, we use a canopy called a cool cabana, which has only has a single pole in the middle and doesn't require any stakes or anchors. The corners are filled with sand and it sets up very quickly and packs down fairly small as well. It's a little on the pricey side at $189, but there are some knockoffs on Amazon that are probably decent. We've used ours a lot in the last two or three years and it's held up well and we're glad we spent the extra money on it. We've had two of the sport brellas, uh, if you're familiar with those, they have the windscreen kind of built into them, and we still use one on occasion, especially on windy days, just as a wind block. And speaking of avoiding sunburn, we just started using a sunscreen spray from Hawaiian Tropic, which goes on really well and isn't greasy or sticky at all, and has that great Hawaiian Tropic coconut smell. We use special sunscreens on our face, but prefer a spray for the rest of our bodies. We definitely recommend putting it on in your home or hotel room before going out, so it has a chance to dry and the wind won't blow it away like it will at the beach. It's $10 for a good size can, which is a little more than other brands, but we think it's well worth a few extra dollars. And we'll put the Amazon link to that in the episode notes. And we're actually not sponsors of either one of these not things, <laughs> but they're really good brands. We really like them and we like the quality of them. So we're just sharing it. Yeah, I'm sharing that with you because, you know, we live here. We use sunscreen year round. We use sunscreen pretty much every day just as a. And the nice thing about this um, Hawaiian Tropic is it's just a nice moisturizer for your mm-hmm. skin. It smells. Who doesn't love the smell of coconut sunscreen? No, it makes I mean, me that's think. That's a happy of, smell. Well, it makes me think of summer all year round. Well, yeah. we're kind of, yeah. It's one of those things that you. you know, your brain goes when we to. Were, good we were times. kids, people used to use the Hawaiian Tropic suntan lotion, which was just, I don't think it did much uh, for clear stuff, but it just smells good. There have been reports of shark sightings on Florida beaches over the last couple of weeks. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission says it's extremely unlikely for a person to be bitten by a shark in Florida waters. If a shark does attack, officials said the injury is typically not life-threatening. If swimming on an ocean beach or inland waters, the FWC recommends staying in groups as sharks are likely to bite a solitary individual. Swim in areas tended by lifeguards and avoid being in water during twilight or darkness hours when the sharks are most active. Sharks also tend to hunt in areas where there are large schools of bait fish, such as openings to jetties. Captain A.J. Miller with the Volusia County Beach Safety says juvenile sharks are swimming around feeding on the bait fish and they grab a person by accident and realize, hey, this is bigger than me and definitely not what I want. And then they release and swim away. Miller also advises surfers to watch out for pelicans diving in the water because that means there's probably a big bait pod. And chances are they're going to be bigger fish chasing those smaller fish, which could lead to sharks as well. 
A common question that people ask is like, do sharks hunt people? Experts say that sharks would much rather feed on fish and marine mammals and really don't care much for human flesh. Sharks have been known to attack humans when they're confused or curious. If a shark sees a human splashing in the water, it may try to investigate, leading to an accidental attack, says Noah. So don't let the shark sightings worry you. You need to be concerned, but don't cancel your vacation because there have been sharks. Yeah, the, the media loves that. Shark sightings, details at 7. Join us on the evening news because uh, it's, it's sensationalized. But there's there's sharks in the water all the time all over the world. So well, it's we not just a big had, deal. We just had a family visiting Hilton Head, South Carolina, and they closed the beach for an afternoon because they saw three black tip? Black tip sharks. Black yeah. tip sharks. Um, and that's just out of precaution. You know, Anna Maria Beach on the um, West Coast had a sighting. And this is a really interesting one, not with Florida, but just generally thinking about the habitat of these animals when they're coming towards shore. In La Jolla, California, sea lions were coming and coming up on the beach barking at the sunbathers and the people who are swimming on the beach. So it's like, okay, this is where they live. Yeah. And this is their home. You kind of need to just listen to the lifeguards and respect the habitat. And respect nature. Yeah, definitely. Sure. If you're a fan of soccer, that's football for the rest of the world. Americans call it soccer. Lionel Messi recently joined Miami's professional soccer team, Inter Miami. He's a, a top, top level a professional soccer player and has already had a big impact on the team. In his first game, he scored two goals in a 4-0 Miami win, which is a big win in, in soccer or football. Uh, he's reportedly making between 50 and $60 million a year, so he better be good. That's crazy, crazy money. Uh, if you're a soccer fan and coming to South Florida, definitely go see a game. The games are played in Fort Lauderdale, but that's been big news. In Florida. Um, 50 to 60 50 million. to 60 million. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So on to our main topic, how to enjoy Florida's wildlife, springs, zoos, and natural habitats and aquariums. Florida has dozens of places to enjoy seeing wildlife, whether it's a zoo, an animal rescue, horseback riding, aquariums, springs with manatees, a farm, or an alligator park. Everyone loves to see alligators. Uh, really, it's the year-round weather and the number of people coming here for trips and vacations help, help gives the budget to help keep these places operating. There's critters to see all, all over the state, and it's fun and educational for your children. And some are indoors, which is a great way to cool off on a hot or rainy summer day here in Florida. So let's talk about some of them. The Gulf Breeze Zoo near Pensacola in the Florida Panhandle is a 50-acre facility where you can hand-feed giraffes, romaine lettuce leaves. You can get up close in the interactive petting area. They haven't forgotten, like, favorite barnyard animals. The farm's a place to enjoy feeding, petting goats, sheep, and other adorable animals. If you'd like to experience an alligator feeding or birds in an Australian aviary, followed up by a guided safari train ride, it's a 30-acre African preserve featuring rhinos, hippos, Western lowland gorillas, Sumatran orangutans, and it's a place to see a variety of wildlife around the world. Bush Gardens in Tampa is a 335-acre theme park, with the entire park landscape and design around the themes of Africa and Asia. As the Anheuser-Busch Company began the construction of a new brewery in Tampa in 1958, the company wanted to include gardens to attract the local community and, and, and contribute landscaped areas along with its construction. The park officially opened to the public for tours on June 1, 1959, as an admission-free facility. Over the years, it's evolved into a combination of thrill rides, live entertainment, and more than 12,000 animals. See more than 200 species at one of America's most highly accredited zoos. You'll see fan favorites such as, as, such as giraffes to critically endangered species. Bush Gardens Tampa Bay provides world-class care to thousands of animals as one of North America's largest zoos. And this is really interesting. Bush Gardens has passed expert third-party audits to join fewer than two dozen facilities in the U.S. as earning the Humane Certified Seal from the American Humane, the world's largest certifier of animal welfare. As you walk through the unique naturalistic habitats, it's clear to see why U.S. News & World Report named Bush Gardens Tampa one of the best zoos in the country. In addition to being one of the best zoos in the country, it's an amusement park and has one of the best, it's one of the best roller coaster parks in the, in the country or in the world with 10 different roller coasters all from different levels. I'm not a roller coaster I love, person. Heather hates roller coasters. I love roller coasters. <laughs> so it's like, it's like wild animals and roller coasters. What more could you ask for? And they have beer in the fall. Um, the history of Bush Gardens is long and interesting. So if you want to read more about it, check out the Wikipedia article we'll put below and you'll see that in the episode notes. A great locals tip for a fun bite to eat before or after visiting Bush Gardens, check out a restaurant called Mel's Hot Dogs, which has been a famous Tampa spot for over 50 years. It's right on the corner of the main parking lot, right on Bush Boulevard. And apparently Mel moved here 
years or 50 years ago. It was from Chicago and couldn't find a proper Chicago hot dog anywhere in Tampa. So he decided to start one. So it's been an institution in Tampa for a long time and it's right on Bush Boulevard. But it's closed on Sundays. Closed on Sundays. We were actually going to go there today after church and it was closed. So um, the hot dogs are about five or six bucks a piece and they've got kids stuff. And they've got other things too. They've got, uh, you know, hamburgers and things for people that don't want hot dogs, but they got about 15 or 20 different kind of dogs. They probably have vegan hot dogs. They probably, probably have yeah. turkey hot dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Horseback riding at Palmasola Bay in Anne Maria Island, which is the southern side of Tampa Bay. Anne Maria Island's a quiet, off the beaten path area with beautiful remote beaches and many homes for rent for family vacations. Consider an experience that will take you into the water on swimming horses. Many of the horses are rescued from all different types of negative experiences or living their happiest and healthiest lives as beach horses. Rescues tend to be the sweetest of them, all due to the extra TLC giving, given and having a forever home. There are many different breeds and sizes to make your ride enjoyable for everyone. Most of the rides are for age 10 and up, but a few as young as three. Explore scenic horseback riding trails in the Tampa Bay area, too. With the beautiful landscape, wander into the great outdoors, which will be able to observe wildlife up close. If you're on the east coast of Florida, you can check out Amelia Island for horseback riding for similar adventures. And apparently horses love water. Yeah, they, they they're not they swim. They is, really do swim. I, we saw a video of it. I thought they were walking on the bottom. Like, no, they're swimming and they're carrying their weight and they've got a human being on and them. That's pa- well, they amazing. probably feel weightless. Yeah, and so you're true. not really adding much. Maybe they, yeah, that's and a good point. Th- apparently from the video that we were watching too, they like the, the feeling of the water um, rushing past them. Yeah, it keeps them cooler. You know, so, all those good things too. I think yeah. it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And who doesn't love a horse rescue? It's great. The Tampa Zoo was built in the 1930s as an animal shelter and plant park on the banks of the Hillsborough River near downtown Tampa. It was started by a city employee and originally consisted of small raccoons, alligators, and an aviary with a variety of exotic birds. In 1957, the council member who would become mayor, Nick Nucchio, moved the Tampa City Zoo to Lowry Park, a larger space, and renamed it Lowry Park Zoo. The zoo shared the park with a small amusement park called Fairyland. As the animal population continued to grow through the 1970s, the upgrading of the animals to a natural habitat became an issue. In the 1980s, the zoo had a major renovation and reopened as Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. Interestingly enough, before the renovation, it it had been labeled as one of the worst zoos in the country, which is interesting that somebody rates the worst zoos. In 1997, a 1,500 square foot interactive area was built featuring hands-on displays, exhibits, artifacts, videos, and a small insect room. Could you have a large insect room? Insects are pretty small. I guess it has to be a small room. It must be a small room. An amphitheater was constructed to allow visitors to observe a variety of owls, hawks, eagles, and falcons. Guests become research interns and travel aboard a custom-built open-air expedition vehicle through the Habari Preserve to get up close with African animals, while the Habari Preserve team teaches them about the amazing animals that call the preserve home. The founder of the preserve, Professor Ron Treadway and Zoo Tampa Research Assistants, lead the orientation tour where guests learn how the zoo is working hard to continue the mission to save wildlife in wild places. In 2014, the 12,000 square foot Catherine Lowry Straws Veterinary Hospital and the 2,000 square foot Animal Commissary were completed. The zoo has has 95 special species survival plan projects, which include threatened and endangered species and species of special concern. The zoo hosts a hospital for Florida manatees in which injured animals are rehabilitated with the intent of returning them to the wild. It's the only nonprofit hospital in the world specifically dedicated to critical care for injured, sick, and orphaned wild manatees. The zoo works in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to rescue, rehabilitate, and release Florida's endangered manatees. Parents Magazine, with 15 million subscribers, named Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park the best zoo for kids, which said they went from the worst zoos in the country to at least the number one for kids. That's pretty great. If you're in St. Augustine, consider visiting the St. Augustine Alligator Farm and Zoological Park. Another option to see the alligators is to zip through the treetops and experience an experience aerial obstacles on the crocodile crossing at the St. Augustine Zoological Park zipline attraction. Across seven acres and on two challenging courses, you'll see live alligators and crocodiles right under you, tropical birds at eye level, and lemurs nearly an arm's length away. More than 50 50 different obstacles will have you flying, climbing, and zooming through the zoo. This particular park hosts birthday parties, community events, adventure camps for kids, and in October, Croctoberfest, brew at the zoo. 
visit the alligators in some of the oldest residents at the alligator farm. These are the Galapagos tortoises. You can book a tortoise encounter and spend 20 to 30 minutes learning all about the largest land turtle in the world. Led by a member of their education team, guests will enter the habitat of the Galapagos tortoise to get close and learn about life on Galapagos Island. Other guided tours, which also are led by their education team, will take you to an assortment of off-area displays where you'll learn about conservation work that they contribute on a local and global scale. Speaking of zoos, there are zoos in Miami, Palm Beach, Brevard County, Jacksonville, Sanford, and others. So wherever you are in the state of Florida, if you want to go to a zoo, you will be able to find one. Yeah, there's one close by. The Everglades is known as one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. Unless you have an expert Everglades tour guide, one who's familiar with the area and what to look for, it's easy to miss out on some of the most spectacular Everglades animals. While alligators are regarded as the primary species of this area, the subtropical wetland ecosystem acts as a home for a variety of wildlife and plants. And the best way to see them all up close is to take an airboat tour. We recommend Everglades Holiday Park in Fort Lauderdale, where you can discover the Everglades with an airboat adventure that glides over sawgrass and cattails located in South Florida, just outside of Fort Lauderdale, Miami. It's right on the canals. Their world-famous airboat tour and alligator park are top attractions for locals and visitors. It's perfect for kids and adults of all ages. The, their fleet of airboats are, are spacious, safe, offer comfort, and cover protection from all weather conditions. I was looking at their website, and they have co- they have a cover over the top. It's a, they're larger than what you typically see in a, in a small airboat that's open, so you can still see outside. But when you get a thunderstorm in the summertime, you're you're not getting you know poured on, you're not getting rained on. So they seem like they've got a great uh, great setup there. It's a safe opportunity to lock eyes with an American alligator and snap amazing pictures as you come face to face with some of the Everglades' most unusual and exciting animals. Then experience a live alligator presentation featuring the Gator Boys Alligator Rescue Team. They do rescue work there in the world-famous Gator Pit. With miles of wetlands, you'll journey deep into the Everglades, zipping across the river of grass at top speed with an expert guide. They also have a webcam on their website, which is a lot of fun, and I'll put that link in the episode notes. You can really see where they are and see the boats on the webcam. It's pretty neat. Don't forget manatee adventures. The manatees roam on the waters of Florida From April through October, when things get chilly in the winter, they head to places like Florida Springs where their temperatures remain constant throughout the year. It may not seem warm when you jump into a freshwater spring, but the water temperature remains around 7 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, which is perfect for the manatee that need that kind of warmth to survive. If you are ready to see some manatees in Florida, here are a few places to check out. I absolutely love this quote from an underwater photographer named Carol Grant. She's actually snorkeled at least 1,200 times with the manatee. When you enter their world respectfully and calmly and watch their lives, a whole lot of understanding comes into place when you see them in their habitat. To see them in clear water, to see mothers and calves, to see them moving around and munching on eelgrass, to see them almost at eye level, it's profound and it's emotional. Her manatee photos are amazing, and we'll put a link Uh, to her website in the episode notes. Definitely check them out. In Three Sisters Springs in Crystal River, Florida, manatees come in huge numbers. You can kayak or take a boat tour to the springs. There can be up to 100 manatees in the area at one time. There are several ways for you to get up close to these charming sea cows with a snorkeling tour, or you can actually enter the springs on your own. We've taken our kayaks there during the winter, and the manatees are, are just sort of rolling and bumping and they're it's, great. It's they're great. So awesome. It's really, yeah. really, they're huge and they're so gentle. The gentle giants. They're as, as big cows. as, they're kind of as big as your kayak. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can see them coming up and out of the water. It's, it's amazing. Blue Spring State Park, which is halfway b- between Orlando and Daytona, is one of the best no boat needed manatee viewing areas. There are several overlooks and boardwalks along the way, and you can make a day exploring the park and watching the manatees. You can't really, almost can't look away from them. They're, they're fascinating. They're fascinating. You watch them for hours. They kind of lumber around, but they're kind of graceful kind of, at the same time. They're just kind of slow. <laughs> they're just they're cute. Yeah, they're great, and they're very popular. A lot of people go manatee watching in the winter here. It's a popular thing. Tico, which is the Tampa Electric Company, has a viewing center called the Manatee Viewing Center in Paula Beach. It's a designated manatee sanctuary to which a large number of manatees in Florida return annually to the warm discharge waters of the Big Bend Power Station. 
Viewing platforms, tidal walkways, and an environmental education center are located in this 50-acre facility, which we visited recently. Parking and admission is free. Ding, ding. Save some money. And they're open November 1st to April 15th. There's a lot to see and do here. It's really cool with walking trails, a viewing tower, and also a tank with stingrays. That you can touch. You can touch them. Yeah, it's great for kids or, or adults, too. So it was recently honored to be on the USA Today's list of top 10 free attractions in the United States. That's a pretty impressive list. They have these really cool solar things that you can just set your phone on and they charge. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, it's, it's environmentally aware place, right? It's, it's great. It's also some PR for, for electric company, which has a power plant next door. But it's, you know, it's a, it's, you need electricity and it's, it's a neat spot. We, but it's a warm spot. You know, the power is... The they, power make, plant, they make the power and the water comes and out And the water warm. comes out warm. So yes. it's a perfect place for it's them to be. Yeah. yeah, they're like warm water, hot tub for manatees. I it's guess. free for the manatees. Yes, they love it. Lee County Manatee Park in Fort Myers is located across from the Florida Power Light Plant and directly on the warm water discharge canal there. Manatee Park is another wintertime haven where large concentrations of the manatees can be seen. They've got several viewing areas there and a butterfly garden and picnic shelters available as well. And that's one of the most beautiful times of the year, really, to be out and about in Florida because it, the humidity is low, the weather's beautiful. So I would suggest anytime you're going Anywhere to see manatee, take a picnic. Yeah, definitely. Make them, yeah, that's you're getting to the fact. Like, January, February, it's perfect. It's great mm-hmm. weather. Great time to be here. Over on the Space Coast, uh, the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, the area there, the Hallover Canal, connects to the Mosquito Lagoon and the Indian River, and on the east side of the bridge is a manatee observation area. Southeastern Guide Dog Incorporated is an amazing place to go if you're a dog lover. If you'd like to learn more about the training of service dogs, consider visiting this this campus. It's located about halfway between Tampa and Sarasota in Palmetto, Florida. Despite the name, it's on the west coast of Florida. The dogs at Southeastern Guide Dog Campus are primarily Labrador retrievers. And at this remarkable facility, you can take a tour of the campus, get information about their sponsor program, sign up to volunteer or foster a puppy. You can even take part in a virtual experience and a trail walk with one of the trainers and the service dogs, which I did a couple months ago, and it was phenomenal. I had no no idea about it. You'll become familiar with the Puppy Academy and Canine University. You can even sponsor a dog or just support a particular dog from infancy through the process of placement. Training of the dogs is a two-year process to get them ready to meet their handler. Southeastern Guide Dog provides dogs for veterans,